Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. Welcome to this Maritime Security Dialogue event on behalf of CSIS and the Naval Institute. We're pleased to be able to bring you the continuation of this series, which is generously sponsored by Huntington Ingalls Industries. Of course, we're lucky to have the exact right guests here today to discuss our topic, movement towards greater integration in naval warfare. Our first guest I'll introduce is Lieutenant General Smith, who's a career Marine infantry officer who has extensive operational experience across the globe from Desert Shield, Desert Storm, all the way to Iraq and Afghanistan. He commanded the 8th Marine Regiment and did a one-year deployment to Afghanistan during that command tour. Later, he commanded Marine Forces Southern Command in Miami, after which he was transferred up and became the senior military assistant to the Secretary of Defense. Following that, he commanded the 1st Marine Division. After that, assumed command of the 3 Marine Expeditionary Force in Okinawa. In June of 2019, he assumed his current responsibilities as the Commanding General of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command and as the Deputy Commandant for Combat, Combat Development and Integration. Welcome, General Smith. We're glad to have you here. Our second guest, Vice Admiral Jim Kilby, is a career surface warfare officer. He also had deployments which spanned the globe and gained operational experience throughout. In his early sea tours, he was on USS Sampson, DDG-10. He was served in USS Philippine Sea, CG-58, two tours on the San Jacinto, CG-56. He commanded USS Russell, DDG-59, and during that tour, he received recognition for the inspirational leadership with the James B. Stockdale Leadership Award. In his first tour, well, I'm leaving out one important thing, which is his tour on USS Monterey, which was his major command, CG-61. In that tour, he did the first ballistic missile defense deployment as part of the phased adaptive approach in the Eastern Med in 2011. In his first tour as a flag officer, he stood up the Naval Surface and Mine Warfighting Development Center in San Diego, after which he commanded the Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group in 2017 with a deployment to the Western Pacific, and then came back and assumed duties as director Naval Warfare Integration, N9I, in the CNO staff, and finally took this current position as the, as the deputy CNO for combat, excuse me, warfare, warfare requirements and capabilities integration, the N9. So with that, I think we have exactly the two right people to talk with today about our topic. And I wanted to read a couple quotes, if I may, to kind of set this up, because there's the two service chiefs have really put some markers down, put some big markers down on this topic of uh, warfare integration between the two services. Uh, CNO Gilday said in 2020, we will fight and win as a team, and we are better when we integrate more closely with the Marine Corps we will build capability with our most natural partner, tying more closely with them at all levels. For his part, Commandant Berger has said the following in 2019. He said, naval integration is the cornerstone of our future naval force. Those are powerful words. And he also said just this year that there's nothing off the table for the Marine Corps and the Navy. So with that, it's a pretty big marker. I'd like to open up with this question for both uh, General Smith and Admiral Kilby, which is if I were a joint force commander, 
what promise does renewed naval integration deliver for me? And I'd also like you, if you could, to weave in and describe the operational challenges that are focusing you on the need for this. And I'll let you start, General Smith. Well, Admiral, first, thanks for, uh, for allowing me to be here with my, with my partner, my shipmate, uh, Jim Kilby. Uh, we spend a lot of time together, and it's personally, professionally, extremely rewarding. I'll just tell you that. My, my very first actual time at sea as a midshipman was on DDG-7 uh, on the Henry B. Wilson, and where I learned to respect uh, how hard uh, our sailors are working out there. Uh, literally one of the marine reasons I became a Marine because I worked far too hard on the Wilson uh, and, and uh, enjoyed being a Marine. But Jim and I kind of share that original DDG, the old Adams class. And so I, that's the first time I went to sea. Um, what I would say is that first and foremost, the, this is based, what we're talking about naval integration and, and where we are going as a naval force, it's based on the threat, the pacing threat, the threat moves per the national defense strategy. So it is all threat-based. So I would say that if anyone questions how, why we're doing this, uh, we're, Jim and I are reading, along with the other uh, deputy CNOs, deputy commandants, reading daily intelligence that requires you to move in this direction. I mean, it, it is as clear as the nose on your face. Regarding the COCOM, if I were a combatant commander, right, I, and I, I don't presume to be, but if, if I were trying to, to explain uh, what we provide to them, that naval force provides any combatant commander, a force that is capable to operate for periods of time when completely cut off or isolated, either geographically or in the electromagnetic spectrum, from the rest of the joint force. We can still carry out mission command. We can still execute what the COCOM directs us to do as the GIFMIC. Um, we can do that under, our goal is under any conditions for as long a period of time as required until we can reconnect with that joint force all the while executing the mission and creating decision space and opportunities for the rest of the joint force. That, that's it in its most simplistic terms from my perspective, sir. Yeah, I agree with it. Eric. I would add only the following in that very complete answer. Uh, if you think of our adversaries, their, their behavior and their program advancing, uh, that is what Eric and I are focused on. and and. Suits, um, creating a force, a naval force, that is a uh, ready service tool for the combatant commander to counter that. So the element that, that we should weave into is maneuver, right? The naval forces provide a maneuverability uh, which is a great asset to all combatant commanders, particularly the Pacific uh, commander. So if you think about the carrier's ability to maneuver 750 miles in one day, this creates a dilemma for the adversary. And the things that the Marine Corps are doing creates a dilemma for the adversary. Uh, the Navy has been working hard on integrated fires for many, many years, which is complex. And the other services are trying to do that now, JADC2 with the Air Force. The Army is doing it with uh, their multi-domain ops, and recently Eric and I went to Project Convergence at Yuma, uh, proving grounds with the Army to watch their version of integration, and we're going to participate in 2021 in the same program. But if you think about adding the Marine Expeditionary Advanced Basing options to that integrated fire uh, capability for the Naval Service, you'll see why we're focused on that. So optionality, maneuverability, the ability to create your own uh, network and then map back into the greater network, that's the value proposition for the combatant commander. So uh, looking at the adversary and having options and being able to exercise those options, I think is a, is a powerful element for the Naval Service. Well, I think that really kind of preempted. I was gonna ask as a second question, where do you see the greatest opportunity in gaining advantage? And I think you may have answered at least in part is to provide those options, but go further. I mean, I'm guessing, and you tell me, but I'm guessing as you've pitched this and briefed this um, within the Navy and the Marine Corps and externally, that this question may have come up, which is why is it that you have to do this when the goal is to work with the joint force 
writ large. And so maybe just to focus this a little more is what are the advantages to this special relationship and what it provides in addition to, not in, comp in competition with jointness? Sure, let, let me start and then kick it to Eric. Um, we certainly fight as a, as a component of the joint force. We're not right. here to say we're substituting the joint force at all. In fact, we rely on elements of the joint force uh, for us. I think um, Brigadier General uh, Steve Lazuski said it best in a, in a panel similar to this where I think Eric couldn't participate and I did it with, with Steve. But he said, uh, hey, flip the script here. If we've thought about green, blue power flowing shore to shore, flip that switch. And now think about the, that green element providing effects to sea. That's different than I've traditionally thought of with the Marine Corps, my career. So if you think about that in the context of some of our most vexing problems, that's a value proposition. And that is something that we have proven in campaign analysis and, and an integrated work with the uh, Secretary of Defense, that that is a winning combination. So uh, the, as we integrate our forces and look to kind of marry up what investments each are making, I think that's powerful. So uh, the Navy is now working with uh, Eric's staff, our analysis divisions, to respond to force design. What does that mean for the Naval, the Navy, to respond to the Commandant's moves? And we're gonna talk about that later, I'm sure, in the brief. But to me, that's the integration that, that, uh, that should happen. And the testing that we're gonna do together, the experimentation. Eric and I have gone to John Hopkins Physics Lab together to understand where each other's heads are, working with uh, the various organizations. We went to another organization last week. So uh, having the ability to not just focus on your program and integrating with, it, with the Marine Corps, but saying, what are you thinking and how can I internalize that and take it back to my program? That's a difference that I've seen. Well, to your point, Admiral, and I'll let uh, General Smith take on that same question, but to your point, I was surprised that just in a couple days, the November uh, Proceedings Magazine will hit the mailboxes, and that's the issue that's typically a Marine Corps-themed issue. And General Berger's article in that issue is the Marine contribution to anti-submarine warfare. So I think it kind of makes that point about flipping the switch, but General Smith, over to you and how to tackle that question. Sure. Sure, the point about the, the, the contribution to the, to the joint force, to the combatant commander, I would say this, there, there is a, uh, a simplicity in the JIFMIC. We, we are the JIFMIC, we're the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander. There's a JFLIC and a JFAC. Um, well, well, we are capable of being a JFLIC our ambient state of being, our natural state of being is part of the JIFMIC. And so that, in my assessment, that simplifies the joint forces issue. They talk to one JIFMIC. And in, in our role, we do supported, su uh, uh, supporting in order to provide that simplicity back to the joint force commander. The pieces that Jim's talking about, the ability to fight from the sea and then the ability to project power from the land in support of the sea is in fact what's different. The, the term littoral means X number of miles for now until such time as we can affect on behalf of the fleets distances greater than what people would originally consider kind of brown water. Um, and that's a determination that's gonna be made at the naval level. What, what's needed? How much influence for distributed maritime operations, sea denial in my, in my portion, do you wish me to do? What do you, as we do these integrated palms that uh, Jim's talking about, what's needed as opposed to, I built this, what can you do with it? Um, we are talking about a truly integrated force development effort so that we are uh, uh, working in tandem to build a JIFMIC that that combatant commander wants, needs, and can most effectively use for whatever O plan, whatever crisis comes up. So I, uh, Jim and I are, I think, plus or minus one degree. We're never more than a degree off here, and it's not groupthink. It's if you look at the intelligence, if you look at the threat, if you look at budgets that are going to be flat or declining, 
there really is only one way you can go, and that is a truly integrated naval force in support of the joint force. And our contribution, again, is both sensing and reporting back to the naval uh, force, but also back to the joint force. We, we will inflict, where required, lethal effects, but our, our greatest contribution may be in the ability to sense and to, to cause effects uh, via our sensing and detection capability. That's something that I think is very important. Well, to do what you both have described, I'm sure um, as you've talked through this, war game through this, and plan this, there must be some insights about systems that would support this. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the network. And do we have the network right? Do the right people have the right access and uh, you know secure network capability to support this? You know, I was always amazed um, back in 2003 that we sent the Marines up one side of the Euphrates and the Army up the other side because they didn't have fully compatible systems uh, for network. And, um, and so some of that's been solved, but some of it hasn't. And so could you give us an insight about what's the job jar now as you look at the world differently, which this does, or at least go back to an idea that maybe was left on the table a while back, a few decades ago. What does that tell you about network and systems? Yeah, so I'll start. I think um, independent of uh, naval integration, but, but pacing it has been my personal realization, particularly with the Vice Admiral Moran, uh, that our system stove pipe approach isn't sufficient. Uh, to field a system from a requirement to a program manager and plug it into the network. So this isn't Navy Marine, this is just within the Navy. Well, certainly within the Navy, but we are doing it with the Marine Corps in mind. So uh, CNO Gilday recently signed out a memo uh, with Secretary Gertz aligning uh, Rear Admiral Doug Small to run a thing called Project Overmatch. And that is in essence, how do we look at our naval tactical grid, naval tactical grid, not Navy tactical grid, uh, with a thought about the joint force. So this is JADC2, it's project convergence with the Army, but do we have it right? And are there some things we can do differently now, big decisions that we can drive that integration much quicker than we would normally have it occur? So we're fairly adept in the Navy at connecting systems, uh, point solutions. The questions we're asking ourselves uh, with the force that we're gonna field, do we have the latency right? Do we have the demand, aggregate demand signal right on the network? And is there a better way to do this? So uh, the alignment of this within the Navy and the Marine Corps is through General Reynolds, General Smith, Admiral Kilby, Jeff Trussler's N2 and 6 and Mike Moran, kind of aligning the program from the three-star level, not just doing a bottoms-up approach, and working with Doug Small to, to kind of fare our way through that. And I think that's a much more results-driven approach than perhaps just letting everything come up from the bottoms up and hope it all works together. There's a, General Smith, I'll let you comment on that. You know, we've all, had this history that we have where at various points when it comes to networks we talk about a common goal but then in the end it's almost irresistible that people roll their own and how do you see it right now obviously you're working very closely with general Lloyd Reynolds and the acquisition side on this how do you sure. see this network challenge uh, t very timely question. I literally was in, in, in a back and forth exchange last night with both Lieutenant General Lori Reynolds, Deputy Commandant for Information, and Brigadier General A.J. Pesagian, who's our Marine Corps Systems Command, uh, Commanding General, about Project Overmatch. And I think that the, the first I would say that there, there's always going to be some slight uh, difference, dissonance, whatever you want to call it, between services. As we go to Joint All Domain Command and Control, that is a requirement so that you get to what was originally discussed as any sensor, any shooter, and I think the Army during Project Overmatch has correctly 
kind of modified that in their, in their vernacular to all sensors best shooter, which I actually like that better because you want to, you want the the sensing to be available to all, but it goes to through an, a, 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 a command and control network or an AI network to the best shooter. There's always going to be a difference between what can go on a cruiser and what can go on the, the back of a Lance Corporal who's operating forward in the first island chain. What we talk about though is what is the data required to produce targeting, uh, target quality information? What's the data packet look like? The form factor is going to change whether it's on a truck or a ship or on a bomber or on a Marine uh, or a soldier. So I view what we're doing now between uh, Admiral uh, Tressler, JT, Jim, Lori Reynolds, myself, as how do we mitigate or minimize the differences so that those differences in what we are producing and procuring are truly a form factor issue based on necessity. It has to fit in this box because the size of a joint light tactical vehicle is X and the size of a DDG uh, is much bigger. If it doesn't meet that criteria, then we, then we at a three-star level start asking real hard questions about, well, why can't we be the same? Because we're, we're looking for the same data transference so that we hold targets at risk 24-7. That's what we're, we're all going after. And I gotta tell you, I think the, the oscillation is minimizing. Just like a parachute is coming down initial, there's that bad oscillation when you jump out of a plane and it starts to minimize. We, we are truly starting to minimize that oscillation to where we're looking for the naval tactical grid. So a couple about. of follow-on questions, if I may. I mean, we've got a, a large industry audience who tunes in here. So here's a chance. And my first question is, is, is in Operation Overmatch, how does industry play and what do you need from them? So I just ask that first. And then as a follow on, I'd say, how do you make sure that you don't develop or co-develop something really, really good that leaves other partners in the dust? Yeah. So just could you talk about that? So I'll, I'll start off. I think Doug is, uh, Doug Small is 30, a few handful of days into his 60 day initial, what's happened? What, let, let me assess the, 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 uh, the network system out here through NAV War, which is his current assignment. Um, but we have done for several years now these things called advanced naval tactical exercises. I don't mean that's a single point solution, but that is a way for industry to come in and, and show. We, we define a problem and industry comes to answer with their version of that. And it's a very uh, driven from Secretary Gertz's staff as an RDT and E to try to focus industry and see what they have to offer to build that into the ecosystem faster. So that is a venue, not the not the only venue uh, for industry to play into that uh, system. But for us to be a little more expressive on here's where we're going and why, we produced uh, a uh, with the with the Marine Corps a definition for the attributes of a naval tactical grid. Like, what, what are we looking for here? What's the resiliency? Uh, what do we think uh, these things that will make this more robust and open to uh, be flexible to those additional services? So I think that was a big step where we tried to define this at a higher level, vice just a traditional requirements document for a system. Uh, now we have to come back and say, what do we think those values of are those attributes in that system? And is it flexible enough to build into the future? So the exemplar uses our first uh, uh, effort at trying to uh, collect requirements for multiple programs under one, which was you know, the Navy Integrated Fire Control Counter Air, where we have a great capability there, but there are four independent programs in the from the sea pillar that come together to create this greater capability. So in order to align that from a, from a resource and program perspective, you've got to throw the lawn dart far enough down to say, this is what we think we're going to do in X year in the future, and then set up a program to pace yourself to get there, where you can measure yourself and say, yeah, we're on track, we're, on tra we're, we're a little behind here, or we need to apply some more resources here because we didn't go there as fast as we could. So I think that that's what this... Uh, uh, approach with the Naval Tactical Grid, that's the approach we're on to kind of lay that down in a different manner than we have in the past. 
I think we just have to share that with industry and be open to the fact that we may not have it solved and we should say, hey, there may be something here. There, there may be a, a software defined radio we should go look at that might help us achieve this end state uh, faster than we would normally with the normal program. So that's the, the tension here is uh, uh, the normal ebb and flow of the Pentagon is the program of record all view, uh, all view new starts as competitors to them. We've got to be a little more thoughtful, I think, moving forward. Well, it strikes me for this, uh, this naval tactical grid, uh, you know, nav war is a logical spot for that, and they do have some pre-existing outreach mechanisms and a door that's there for industry. But you mentioned uh, integrated naval fires, and, uh, you know, that's, that does cross different tribes within the Navy, and that's proven difficult. So now, if that's X difficulty, how is the, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth and project a problem, but it strikes me that it's at least 2X difficulty to do that same level of integration for programs that have weapons delivery requirements, that, and those standards are high. And I just ask you, uh, General Smith, to talk about that, I mean, I'm envisioning like groups of naval officers, Marine and Navy in, in pods, you know, hashing this out is, yeah. where's that activity happening? Is it happening? What can you tell us? Sure, uh, so very quickly, and I'll, and I'll be, I'll try to be succinct and, and touch on one point that you mentioned about industry uh, and then roll into the second part. So what, what Jim mentioned, you know, the Advanced Naval Technolo Technology Exercise, okay, the ANTAX, that's a great place for industry to, to bring their products. Now, I will say that what we're looking for specifically, and I talk to industry partners literally, if not daily, pretty close to daily, we're looking for low probability of intercept, low probability of detection, low signature, so we can conduct true signature management, long duration, everything from battery life uh, through the ability to not have to repair stuff as we're forward as the inside force that, that is trying not to add to the N4's difficult task of resupplying the naval force. So we also need the range in the expanse of the Pacific to be able to pass that communication to airborne means, ground means, surface means, subsurface means. So that's what we're looking for from industry. And when we do things like Antex, we'll put that out there. And there's kind of two tents. There's the up close tent that all the VIPs go to. That's in all candor, not being a smart aleck and that folks in the industry uh, know me, this is just how I speak. If you bring those things that the Commandant and the CNO have asked for, you kind of go in tent one. If you bring stuff that we didn't ask for or clearly don't need, you probably go in tent two, which is somewhere down the road left of the Port of Johns. Because um, we kind of need you to bring what we're asking for, not stifling technology. Your, your question about the 2X harder for with, if there's an issue within uh, tribes within the Navy, I would say there's also that challenge even in the Marine Corps, you know, because we are a MAGTAF and we have never ceased being a MAGTAF. So we're, we're always balancing the air, ground, logistics, and the command and control, those four elements of the MAGTAF. That's an internal issue we, we struggle with as well. But I actually think it's made simpler when you're talking about the GIFMIC, because in all candor, if you talk to the young Marines out in 3MEF, um, if you talk to them, they just want to go fight. They, you know, the old saying, and this is not bravado, there's the old saying, nobody likes to fight, but somebody has to know how. That's not true. There's a bunch of Marines that just want to fight. They want to be part of the FMF. They want to be employed as a composite warfare uh, command. They just want to go do what the fleet commander needs them to do. And so there's this impetus in 7th Fleet and 3 MEF, and 3rd Fleet and 1 MEF. For those flag officers, they are working extremely closely and a lot of the parochialism is already gone as it comes up the different echelons. I, I, and I, and I, I'm not being Pollyannish here or pie in the sky, that's actually already happening. For who delivers fires, who delivers info, nobody cares. We just want, as the naval force, to work this out and when these, the echelons coming up to the Pentagon say, we need this, then it goes to JT, Jeff Tressler and Lori Reynolds to work out, okay, what, what are we missing here? Back to your earlier point about, show me why we can't be together on this. 
due to a form factor. That's actually already happening. And it's, it's pretty stunning, maybe an overused word, uh, down at the fleets, already happening, already happening. No, that's excellent to hear. Not why, but why not? And, uh, exactly. and make it happen. Um, well, look, uh, changing gears slightly here, it seems like a lot of what the insights and, uh, and the effort that you have would inform changes in command relationships, that, that tweaks maybe, I'm not suggesting you'd throw the, the whole thing out, but um, how is that going and what form is that taking? I mean, it's not in the um, exact job jar of YouTube, but it, it seems like it's an essential task to get the command relationships right and the doctrine right again. Yeah. So what, what is, what's going on in that? Well, I brought, I brought this prop here. This is uh, the first step where we rejuvenated our Naval Warfare NDP-1, which was signed up by the Commandant, the CNO, and, and the Commandant of the Coast Guard in April. So the wor work is under, underway. I'd say we still, uh, the work to be done really is the TTP at the unit level to do that connectivity we're talking about. And Eric and I frequently uh, live in the what, I'd live in the what if world if I could use the track data from a Gator radar. How would I, how would I do that and practice that? So there's an element here that strikes me of uh, early days of NIFCA where it required our best operators to go do this. And then we had to say, okay, let's assume we have a brand new uh, aviator or SWO executing that. Does this TTP hold? Do I have the ability to execute this at that fleet level? So similarly, we have to do the same thing when we, when we try to um, close that fire control loop using data from a Gator radar so a ship can shoot if it's, in a, if it's in an MCON position or vice versa. So to me, those are the TTP uh, things that need to happen. I do think Eric's point is really spot on. If you talk to the number of fleet commander, Bill Murs and General Clarity, they are working together. Uh, their predecessors have worked together and done things pretty darn quickly where I remember being in 9i and Brad Cooper, when he was in his job, said, hey, we have an opportunity here to, to do something with an F-35 Bravo and a baseline nine destroyer. And can we set something up in a tactically meaningful way to get some data to help inform us? And they did it. So I think those kind of things need to keep happening so we can develop that doctrine, not only to war game it, but actually affect it and do it on a routine basis where we're confident in it. Hey, Tim, uh, Admiral, I would also just quickly, I would a echo that, because when that happened with Brad Cooper, it was uh, Phil Sawyer had seventh fleet and I had three MEF, and they, you know, it was mostly, just don't get in the way of, of, the, of the, the young Turks, right? Because they're, they're already, and they've been doing this for a couple of years before we had the, C, the CPG and the CNOG. They, they were already doing this. They really were. I mean, it's, that is a historical fact. So I would say the, the General Berger's been pretty clear that when we talk about naval integration and the command and control relationships, first we gotta truly know each other. If you wanna be the deputy GIFMIC and you're wearing this uniform, Marine uniform, you have to understand why that oiler is so important to that fleet commander, why you know, he's, he's focused on his uh, attack submarines. If you don't understand that, you can't be the deputy GIFMIC. So, and, and, and by the same token, the fleets are truly trying to understand how littoral operations in a contested environment work so they can best employ that element of the command. Um, we just finished Naval Services Game 20 down in Quantico, where we experimented with some of these command, and I'll be careful because the, the classification of the game obviously exceeds the, uh, this discussion, but, but what I can tell you is that it was focused on the C2, the different relationships that may or may not work. And we had Bill Murs, 7th Fleet Commander, had here for the entire week, endured the, the COVID restrictions, the fleet commander here for the whole week. I had the, not I, Brigadier General Watson, who runs our warfighting lab, had the Deputy Commanding General for Fleet Marine Forces Pacific, was here for the whole week, as was the Deputy Commanding General for 3MEF. I mean, we had the players in the room for a week, just, it was brutal, the schedule was brutal exercise in these C2 relationships to see what works. So it's actually being tested, experimented with, and then, well, 
it's being wargamed, it'll be experimented with in future uh, exercises. And COVID has slowed us a little bit, but, but it hasn't stopped us. So it's actually happening, and uh, I'm actually pretty excited about what I saw last week at Naval Services game. You know, I think about Global 11, where Admiral Aquilino ran the game as the, as the Jeff Mick, but his deputy was General Craparata, right? So that's another instantiation. That was, that was a long time ago, relatively speaking. So I would say there's a track history building of, uh, of the behavior that Eric's trying to describe here. Uh, but it is important to not just episodically get together, but consistently get together so you have that perspective. Uh, at least Eric, I try to model that with Eric, as, and certainly I would say, and I have said publicly, I talk to Eric as much as I do the other, the other DCNOs, uh, maybe more so in some cases. Same. Yeah, I talk to Jim more than, at least as much or more than the other deputy commandants. And I would also say on Lou Craparata, John Craparata, he is now in the three-star in charge of Training Education Command. What, what better guy to have come from FMF PAC working this out with Admiral Ocalino to now own the schoolhouses yeah to start teaching this to the captains, the majors, the lieutenant colonels, so we don't just stumble into this naval integration piece if you happen to be on a, on a staff at the right level. Now we're trying to teach it at all echelons. You know, an interesting optic, uh, this is a little off script, but Eric invited me down to talk to all their 05s and 06s. All the commanders, the rising commander, yep. I don't know that we've done that before, yeah. but he and I stood on the stage for 90 minutes and we talked and gave them a brief called the Maritime Fight Brief for, for the first half of the brief. And we kind of went back and forth as we have done many times. But then we just took questions about leadership. Right. And, and Eric tossed questions to me and it was a very uh, robust exchange. Uh, so I, I think you have to watch us and we have to, we have to do what we're telling you you do. And, and I would encourage, uh, encourage folks like the Naval Institute to hold us accountable for that that our actions are actually in keeping with what we say we're doing. Well, also, just as an aside, we've seen some good articles about mission command. And, uh, you know, when I'm just envisioning the picture there, Admiral Kilby and uh, General Smith, of all those, uh, you know, 05s, 04s, 05s in that auditorium, I think you have to ask yourself, what is the thing that bonds them? And to me, there's so much common DNA at the mission level order uh, DNA. And, uh, and it strikes me that a lot of what you're trying to do fits that, that you're getting advantages from, uh, you know, this is what I'm trying to do, and you tell us uh, what's the best way to do it. And uh, so I think that's encouraging, and we will do that with proceedings and keep, uh, keep down that road. Yes, sir. Yeah. One um, other example of the mission command piece while we're on it is this, these fleet battle problems. Those, are, those didn't happen in my youth, but they're happening now. Yes. Where I'm done, I'm certified, but I'm still being tested by the four-star fleet commander that I am able to execute the mission. And, and it's not a short duration mission, it's days. Uh, so I think that's healthy as well. Well, we're gonna throw it over to the audience in, uh, in a minute. And uh, we've asked for and gotten some great questions but one last question for me, and I know that uh, because of who you are and what's in your job descriptions, that you've worked very hard on the integrated naval force structure assessment and the recent OSD-led study on naval force structure study. Um, those are not; those results aren't officially out yet. But is there any um, insights that you can share as just a glimmer of? It, it just seems to me there's such a strong intersection between the kind of thinking that you've already outlined today and some of the things that might inform future force structure. And I'd give this one first to General Smith. Is there, is there an insight here that you could share? I think so. So I'll lead. That way if I get in trouble, uh, you know, they take, yeah. they take my head. That way we, we preserve Jim because he, <laughs> he's got a, a long and bright future in our, in our Navy and we need him. Um, I, I would say this, what, what the most important piece was, for, from my perspective, um, is that the need for a balanced fleet, right? The, the, the fleet exists to execute X mission, Y mission, and, and the balance of that fleet is what is really important. It, you, you can't 
pick and choose pieces, parts, and look at the easiest way to get to X or Y number. You have to look at the totality of the fleet and its capability, of, of which we are a proud part, the Marine Corps. Um, th that was, for me, what has, has come out in, in every analysis we've done, every review we've done, up to include the FNFS, which is that the, the balance of that fleet is important. It's the, uh, in my assessment, it's the key element. It's as simple as that, and I'll give it to Jim from there. i just say uh, briefly, we spoke last with you, I think, in December yep. last year, where we were completing the integrated naval force structure assessment, and in uh, February we announced that we were going to go continue to work on that w under the guidance and leadership of the Secretary of Defense with CAPE and J-8 and uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps. And that work is, is as you alluded to, uh, culminating here. But it was consistent. Now there are different horizons, right? In our, in our force structure assessment process, we typically took a 10-year view. And this year we went farther. We went farther to 2045 was the, was the target period. The farther you go out in the future, the less sure you are of what it's going to be. So we had different uh, um, expressions of what we thought red could be, you know, and we had different expressions of what we thought blue could be. But I think it's consistent with what we've talked about in many forms where we had a more distributed force. We had uh, played the elements that uh, Eric laid out earlier where we're able to establish our own ability to have effects if we don't have the full uh, national technical means available to us. We looked at some specific platforms and said, wow, they're, they're as impactful as we thought they were. We looked at uh, our other elements of our fleet, our amphibious force structure, and said, hey, we probably need some new elements here to help us with expeditionary advanced basing operations, supporting littoral operations in a contested environment. So I think all those things were consistent with what we found in the past. I, I think what was most healthy from my view of the interaction was this ability to kind of step back and question and not be my answer versus your answer, but say, let's look at this answer together. Yeah, there's some merit there. We need to go study that some more. We need to go explore that. So I think uh, when you see the results come out, there'll be more work for us to go do. Uh, and Eric and I are doing some of that work right now between N81 and OAD to go do analysis about the amphibious force structure to align to the Commandant's force design. That's not a separate effort. It's informed by FNFS and will uh, inform shipbuilding plans in the future. So I view this as an ongoing process, not as a pens down, term paper handed in. Will we recognize naval integration in the FN? I SN. think you will. I, I think you will. Okay. All right. Well, I could talk more, but I want to get to the questions. And uh, these were submitted, as I said, by our audience. And the first question is from David Iwata, LD2 Group Incorporated, based on the recently published Irregular Warfare Annex in the NDS. What elements of IW will be integrated in this effort? Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll start out. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we're looking at in a particular theater is the counter C4 ISRT ability of which IW plays prominently in that. So I would say we're going to continue to really invest in this area. I, I alluded to fleet battle problems. And uh, for those of the audience that's not familiar with that, this is a, this is a multi-day event where emissions control is, uh, is something that we're really working hard on in the Navy, the Naval Forces, and understanding what your signature is and how to control it and what, how that will be uh, viewed from the adversary. So I think uh, the ability for us to kind of do this in a consistent fashion will be key for the naval, uh, the naval forces. But I, I don't want to bust the classification area here and, and make sure we're mindful of that. But it is an area that's clearly on our mind and in our planning for the budgeting cycle that we invest in those capabilities. Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, Jim Kilby hit it um, correctly for both services. It is an area where there is, 
it is, it is actually almost difficult to talk about any of it with any substance without breaking classification level. It truly is because we all know that the threat is, is taking note of everything that we publish that we say. It is foundational to pacing against a peer competitor. I mean, it is truly foundational. It, it is embedded within everything you do when we talk about emission control, low probability of detection, low probability of intercept. So I would say that uh, after Jim, the person I'd probably talk to the most is Lori Reynolds. Um, because operations in the information environment, the, the ubiquitous term, could consume everything. I mean, everything can almost fit under it. So I, I, will be my, I won't add more than Jim is at it because I think he hit it right. But I would just say that it's not a dodge. It's just, it is really difficult to talk about that particular entity without staying so high level that it's almost meaningless. We'd have to almost go to a different setting uh, with industry we do to really get into some details. If I could ask for one more nickel on that. Sure. Uh, just watch the Navy how uh, we organize and do things differently and does it match that site picture. So the information warfare community selecting an information warfare commander from a competitive cycle to go help manage that for the strike group commander is different. That is a different thing than we've done traditionally. There's been times where the carrier CO had that responsibility and some others. This selection process and the acknowledgement of the complexity of this, I think, shows where our, where our heads are, where we have to go. And I'll throw so. my two cents in on top of Jim's nickel, which is to make sure that, that I don't want any pitchforks and torches from the, uh, the MEF Information Group commanders coming to my house because we have, we have three MIGs, MEF Information Groups, and that's what they do for those MEF commanders. And the uh, first one started by uh, now Brigadier General Bobby Shea, uh, Roberta Shea, out at, uh, at one MEF. We converted the the headquarters group into the MEP information group. And from that group, all things flow in the IW world. No, that's good. I think we could spend time there, but uh, we'll right. have to move to this next one. It's a bit of a lengthy question. It's mostly aimed at the Navy. Um, it's from Lieutenant Commander James Lamb, USNR, Third Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. And he said, as integrating new and expanded maritime fires capabilities will be a key part of the improved blue-green integration. Does the Navy have a plan to professionalize a career path for officers who focus on this integrated naval fire support? I've shortened this question no, no, it's a, a little great, bit, but it's I think a, it's a... Yeah, it's a great question. It. I would say, uh, first of all, I'll defer this to our uh, John Now, who is our N1. But I am unaware of that right now, that effort. I, I will say the closest thing we have to that is uh, the Surface and Mine Warfighting Development School uh, has invested in a warfare tactics instructor called an amphibious witty. And that was designed to try to match the green team and produce an officer with deep understanding of those missionaries that would compete in great power competition. So I, I think that is where I'd go for first. But certainly we've done some things in the past where we've uh, initially, in the initial days of BMD, we had an AQD for officers that had actual experience. That might be an area for us to look at. Uh, but we view our, the ability to provide those precision fires as a key naval contribution. So when we think about our programs together, that is a key element for sure. I think uh, I think that is what the question was about, was the Navy side of it. So I'll move to the next one, which is um, a gentleman named David, who's uh, Naval Information Warfare Systems Command. He goes, after years, if not decades, of R&D budget cuts, what is the strategy to invest in innovative new technology in the future to even suggest being competitive with our adversaries? And he's, he's getting at the fact that we've invested, but maybe not fully invested in the past. And uh, is there an R&D component of your effort that uh, you could tell us a little bit about? Me or I, First, I'll give it to yeah. the general. Okay. So, so I would say this uh, for David. Um, budgets are flat and declining. 
So if you're talking about more, I, I don't know that that is, um, I don't know that that's viable. It's about using what we have best, and to that end, what we have seen, really, I don't remember when that was signed, Jim, in the last two months, you're seeing a R&D council, yeah. for lack of a better word, between the vice CNO, the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, and assistant uh, uh, secretary of the Navy, Gertz, to focus on how do we spend what we have appropriately so we're not duplicating efforts. And we're integrated at the ONR, the Office of Naval Research level, between Admiral Selby and Brigadier General Watson, who's the deputy ONR. So starting there at the, at the one and two star level, working up to the vice CNO, assistant commandant, and ASNRDA level to direct those resources that we do have appropriately. I, I feel pretty comfortable. We literally just started that. Um, and I'm pretty confident that that's going to produce some efficiencies. I know everybody hates that word, but it'll produce some efficiencies because I don't see significant opportunities for more R&D money flowing our way um, based on a flat and declining budget. So that's a start point, but we have considered it. And I, I think that group is going to give us some ability to, to make our resources go a little further. I, I just double down on what Eric said. Is this governance is, is uh, something that uh, Secretary Gertz has been working on for some time. Like, let's look at the totality of our R&D budget and make sure we're spending it where we should. So he, he established a study probably three years ago now, the study reported out, and he's been moving things within the organization to kind of tighten down on this shot picture to make sure we have a consistent approach. Um, I, I guess I'd say one other thing that's interesting that would get at David's question is uh, Admiral uh, Lesher, who was the N8, now is the Vice Chief, when we put together our approach for our, uh, putting together our New Year's budget, he, he introduced a, a criteria that we haven't always looked at uh, fully, which is called innovation. So he said, produce to me the program and show me how much innovative things we're investing in vices, how much incremental change we're making. So I think that that's an acknowledgement uh, that we need to kind of look at it from a holistic approach. So you're seeing this uh, awareness that we need to be a little more thoughtful when we move forward. I, I just offer that. Okay. So this question is from Commodore Anil Jai Singh, Indian Navy retired. He's the Vice President of the Indian Maritime Foundation. He asks, the evolving maritime scenario in the Indo-Pacific highlights the need for cooperative security architecture and greater integration among maritime forces. Given there's no formalized multilateral security alliance amongst the Quad nations or even amongst the larger Indo-Pacific region, uh, with countries like India stressing strategic autonomy as a cornerstone of their foreign policy, how would these forces integrate their capabilities in a conflict or even a scenario just to the left of conflict? I mean, it's certainly a challenge is that as you get better with each other, do you leave people behind? We talked about the joint force. What about other partners? Do you want to start or you sure. want me to start? Uh, I'll, I'll do a very quick one. So uh, one for the Commodore, thanks for that question, because that is a, that having just come from the Indo-Pacific, uh, that is a vital question. And obviously, I will not tread into Admiral Davidson's waters um, as the combatant commander. I would offer a in having this professional military education discussion, I'm comfortable saying that I, my assessment is that what we have to make sure as we move forward, the, the American Marine Corps, the American Navy, as we move forward, we have to make sure that we and our allies and partners such as India are interoperable. So when we, when we move forward with new technologies, are we fully informing our partners so that as we go into exercises like a RIMPAC or a, a Pacific Blitz, do we take the opportunities, and again, not trading into Admiral Davidson's waters, do we have take the opportunity to ensure that when and if we choose as sovereign nations to uh, work together toward a specific problem set, are we able, are we interoperable? That goes all the way back to 
frequency management. It goes back to, I mean, it's everything from the size of a litter for a, a, a casualty that's evacuated. Do we, are we interoperable? And I think that leaves then us as military professionals free from the political question of will we have a command and control relationship between two sovereign nations? It's are we able to? And I think that's done through exercising, through war gaming, and through staff talks, which I know occur between our, our navies, our Marine Corps, and obviously at the joint level. And I'll, I won't tread any further than that for fear of getting into someone else's lane. I, I just add that that's a key, you know, we are, we are on the cusp of, I believe, releasing a tri-service maritime strategy. A component of that is our work with allies and what we continue to do with allies. I just say one little sea story from, um, from my past where uh, when I deployed in 2017, we had an uh, opportunity to operate closely with the Republic of Korean Navy for 30 days. That's about four times longer than your normal exercise. So uh, if, we, if we push ourselves to really challenge our interoperability, and in this case we had, uh, we had some challenges uh, exchanging uh, data information with one of our destroyers. So we had to, we had to go explore that. It became part of the post-deployment brief and, and an acknowledgement that, that that exercise, which we had kind of glossed over because we made it work by a very scripted way, we had undercovered uh, perhaps an area that we can improve on. So I think we must continue to challenge ourselves there because our strategy is based on operating with our allies and being able to uh, bring effects to bear. Uh, and we acknowledge that there's going to be different levels of their capabilities, but they're all important for us to have this uh, aggregated force from, from our perspective. So we'll continue to pressurize from the naval integration part, the blue-green team of the Navy and the Marine Corps, and acknowledge those other efforts that must happen as well. Okay, well, we have a final question here, uh, but it's a two-parter because I, I see that two different people asked about logistics and prepo. And I think there's two sides of the same coin. Steve Alonzo, CTO at Marine Electric Systems Incorporated, said studies have shown that there's insufficient tanker, row, row, brake bulk, and other shipping to support some of our operational plans. And how can we sustain integrated operations with, without the proper logistics? And then John Kaskin, Navy League of the United States, former member of the CNO staff, he said currently the Navy provides substantial lift and sustainment for larger scale, longer duration marine operations through the maritime prepositioning squadrons in the Pacific. The Commandant has stated in the CPG with these squad that these squadrons are too valuable and may be too vulnerable and they won't necessarily provide the capabilities needed in future contested operations. So he's asking what is the current marine thoughts on what the Navy should acquire to replace the MPS RONs if that's the case. It just seems like this logistics thing was always there but now with one larger integrated force with some different systems uh, at sea for longer periods perhaps, the problem is not any easier. So I'd, I throw it over to the general first on two sides of that coin on logistics. So, so thanks for that, that question. And I would tell you, I'll start uh, very quickly with, with the MIPSRONs. This is a, a piece on naval integration that's important as a scene setter. Um, as the Bobo class ages out uh, here in, in just a few years, one of the first things that uh, Jim did, Jim Kilby, is said, hey, Eric, we're going to have to come up with a replacement. You need to sit uh, with me as we do the requirements evaluation team, for, as we did with the light amphibious warship. You, you know, and as we're talking about you know, what, what uh, would be the after an LPD-17 Flight 2, we're, we're working this together. I don't have a veto in that. It's just Jim has said, hey, you, you got to sit here as well so we can have this discussion from the ground up. So we're actually talking about that now. The MIPSRONs are a part of the totality of the naval force that I believe is required to be able to not only project, but to sustain the power that we keep forward deployed. So if you go all the way from a MIPSRON with the ability to do uh, potential skin-to-skin -skin transfer, 
and if the MIPSRONs are properly loaded, and that's on, on the Marine Corps to make sure that those packages that are in there are loaded for limited unambiguous warning to quickly offload pieces that would be used by an expeditionary advanced base operation. They can't be, you know, a major combat operation, take over a huge deep draft port, offload everything and then sort it out. It has to be packaged, uh, which we are working now. So it's more agile. That makes it, the TTP of, of using it makes it better. Then you move it down into your L-class ships and then your your light amphibious warship and then your connectors. That totality of things, in my assessment, is what gives us the ability to support the fleet commander. So I don't think any one piece is the key, but going back to the FNF, FNFS, the totality of those elements, MIPSRON on down, are really required to not just start, but to sustain the force. And he is correct in that the, this is the wicked problem. The, the, Prepositioning the sustainment of a force in the long haul through both competition and crisis um, up to conflict. That is the wicked hard problem that we're all trying to solve. And Jim's got a few things that he's working on. So, well, hard. just to say, just to clarify though, so it suffice to say that in the, the FSNSF or whatever we're calling it, um, the future force structure analysis, um, that this played prominently, that this got a strong look. I'll take it. It, it did. Uh, we have work to do there. Uh, so I want to just cover kind of some bookends to what Eric talked about. In addition to what he talked about, there's a sea lift recap piece that N4, Admiral Williamson, and Transcom, and everyone is working through acknowledging that aging part of the fleet. The Miptron piece, I can't add to what Eric said. I think he covered it down. I, I guess I would just say, as I said in a couple other forums, uh, we probably let ourselves get too efficient and not effective. So if we cast, if we look through that lens, the effective lens of FNFS and frankly INSFA before, we saw that we needed some additional things. And one of those things uh, that Eric didn't mention was a next generation logistics ship. So that's a smaller ship than our traditional CLF ships, but it's a ship that could uh, help uh, replenish SAGs, could help replenish Marines could add offload things to light amphibious warships that go support Marines. So it's this greater ecosystem of logistics ships that we're exploring and understanding we need to probably do some investiture to. Admiral Williamson is, is uh, looking at studies for that next generation logistics ship as a complement to what we've done. Uh, we talked in other forums about uh, medical uh, lift and and uh, do we have a ability to do role two care? So one of the things we're looking at is modifying one of our ships with role two care to take a number of casualties out. Should we have to do that? So I think it's this greater lift, and I think John Caskins is exactly right. It's a pertinent question for us, and we have to get after it, and, and we have to make our force effective, not Wait, efficient. Well, you've mentioned two important ones, uh, logistics and the medical piece. Um, how about the repair piece? You know, yeah. we've, uh, we got very efficient on getting rid of uh, forward repair capability. Is there something to be, is there something to be said there? Yeah, I think we, we have certainly a tender recap piece of this. Admiral Williamson is a, is a great N4 because he brings a view that I don't have because of his experience. So he's like, tell me the capability you want and I'll give you options to get it there. So it may not just be a tender, it may be another capability. The other thing we're looking at is VLS rearm at sea, right? So that is, an, that is a capability we had many, many years ago, we walked away from and we're reinstituting that, realizing our munitions are much longer and heavier than they have been in the past. So how do we do that at some, uh, some, some capability where we don't have to go back to a naval base to do that? So I think those are exemplars of us kind of pushing that and having a, a more robust force, a sustainable force. Well, this has been a terrific discussion today. And uh, of course, we could keep this discussion going because we've, we've proven, once again, we do have the two right people that are here to talk about it. And I'd like to thank you, uh, General Smith, and you, Admiral Kilby, for coming out today um, in this environment that we're all finding ourselves in and uh, doing this session extremely informative and uh, I want to thank our audience 
for coming out. I'd like to thank them for their great questions. And also, once again, acknowledge uh, Huntington Ingalls Industries for their sponsorship. So again, on behalf of the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Naval Institute, we thank you both and we'll sign off on this session. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Admiral.